Okay. <laughs> um, so, first of all, before I get into this, um, so as a whole, the class did well. Um, just a very quick fact with the envelope cal calculation. Um, uh, high 80s, I think like, I think like 88 point something. If the arithmetic in my head was correct, um, nobody got 100. Uh, although a couple of people got uh, an epsilon uh, of it. So, um, and actually seeing, oh, okay, last time I reported the uh, grades, the averages for graduate and undergraduate separately. And, um, if I put that together, I think this, uh, I think uh, the overall class average this time is a little bit better. Um, okay, now, um, I want to point out uh, when I go through this, the, the solution I have written up here for this problem, this problem is, is new, is uh, one for practice, and I'm going to tweak it as I go to adapt to this problem. Um, so that means it needs to com compute certain things in, in uh, math as I go. So we're approximating the exponential by this function right here. Um, and um, the, way this the way this approximation comes about is the numerator, you can think of that as a Taylor approximation of e to the minus h over 2. And then the numerator, or the denominator rather, is an approximation of e to the plus h over 2. But because the e to the plus h over 2 is in the denominator, that's the same as another e to the minus h over 2, so the whole fraction would be e equivalent to e to the minus h. Um, so it, it, like taking e to the minus h, breaking it down this way, and approximating each part by a Taylor series. Um, these are kind of approximations of the exponential will actually be relevant in the next semester, for those of you who go on to that, um, from uh, the American Methods for OEs. Uh, so that was the, the inspiration um, for this problem. Okay, so, um, all right. So what happens here, um, I mean, this this part it wasn't really an issue. Um, Um, so then we go ahead and compute um, all, all these uh, um, approximations. So we have. I'm around that with negative 8.3. Yeah, that's, that's, that's yeah. not what it was. Um, okay. yeah, yes, that, that, that is uh, what it turned out to be. I need to update this. Uh, to be honest. Three point three, I think it was. Yeah, I'm going to have negative 0.3 times 10 to the negative 5th. Um, okay. Um, hold on. I'm looking at my notes here. Okay. Uh, times 10 to the minus 5 um, is what it turned out to be. Okay. Um, I need to get rid of this because that's not what this is. Okay. All right. Um, and then the uh, relative backward error. Um, so what you're doing is you are um, taking your uh, getting your h naught half by taking minus the natural log of your approximation, and that in this case turns out to be um, very close to zero point one. Um, Okay, I'm just going to go ahead and flip over to MATLAB and uh, compute these things. I have zero one one zero zero one. Okay, so here we find function hence for a true function in the approximation. Um, then y naught is from the exponential. Y hat naught is the approximation. Um, Okay, and then the uh, 
the error, yeah, minus eight point three to ten to the minus five, and then to get the uh, uh, okay, I'm going to take minus natural log of my approximation using my h naught hat. So we are very close to uh, point the, the original h naught of point one. So uh, one point oh oh eight. Um, okay. right. um, uh, what? It, and the back it was zero point one zero 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 eight. Wait, hold on. Uh, yep. This is the value. I just typed it wrong. Please bear with me. Okay. Um, and then the relative backward error is, uh, okay, so 8.3 times 10 to the minus 4. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, and then the relative forward error, relative backward error, you divide uh, your, your uh, forward error up here by your backward error down here. I think the absolute value, and you get the uh, 0 0.1. Um, that's not the right. Um, that is what you should have done. So, well, I got dead right. Um, okay. Yeah. So, okay. Well, well, for me, well, well, for B, I had 0 0.001 as my final answer. Um, okay. Um, all right, so, so that's a condition number, which turns the, and the thing is, your function is e to the minus h, and your um, uh, derivative is minus e to the minus h, so an absolute value will cancel out, leaving only the, uh, the x value, really the h value, which is, is 0.1. So, uh, so there's no surprise that, that that would happen when it's the exponential. Um, and then you go ahead and do this again with a smaller value of h. Um, and what happens in this case, um, you have to be careful about this because um, when you're computing this, um, uh, because these values, this is a more accurate approximation of the exponential than the one from a practice midterm. So, um, so these values are gonna be fairly close to each other. And if you don't retain enough decimal places, then what happens is you get uh, you run a risk of catastrophic uh, cancellation. Um, so um, you might be better off doing these things in math. If I change value of h not to zero point zero one, and I go ahead and compute um, the exact value and the approximation again, um, and then I compute the uh, forward error in this case. So it's minus 8.3 times 10 to the minus 8. Um, okay, so let me get rid of a part I don't need. So there are a few points lost on this due to this value not being computed correctly. So this is actually an instance of catastrophic cancellation, depending on how you rearrange your formula. Um, because you, know, you could have, you uh, might have rewritten this fraction as um, this times e to the plus h naught um, uh, minus one. Um, and that, that fraction that you're subtracting one from is actually very close to one. So what happens is, the so previous forward error when h naught is 0.1 was minus 8.3 times 10 to the minus 5. So what happens is h naught is repeated by a factor of 10, and a relative forward error is repeated by a factor of 1,000, roughly. So the rate of convergence is suggested to be order h cubed by computing forward error with these different h naught values. Um, um, the last part of this, um, when you're doing the, uh, actually computing the relative forward error, 
So I'm going to update this expression here. 1 plus h over 2 plus h over 2 times h. And um, what happens is this can be rewritten as okay. 1 plus h over 2 in the denominator. And then you have e to the h times um, 1 minus 2 minus 1 2. Yeah. Um, okay, just, just from outbreak manipulation of the expression um, to, uh, to get this. So then what you could do is this exponential, you can replace with a Taylor expansion. Now, what happened in some cases is, uh, it, and what I observed is that the, the Taylor expansion actually needs to go out a little further than um, in the, the one from a practice. Uh, because what, if, you, if you take it out this far, then you, you end up uh, having a situation where, uh, where every, everything cancels. Um, so if I take this out one step further than I did before, <coughs> okay, so this is the next term, the Taylor, Taylor remainder. Uh, then we have one minus h over two. And then this is multiplied by Okay, all over 1 plus h over 2. Sorry, I just have to update this. Okay, so, um, so what ends up happening is when you uh, multiply this out, so you have uh, the constant terms all canceling, the terms of uh, that have h to the first power, you have um, h here. When you have minus h over 2, minus h over 2, those cancel out. Uh, any quadratic terms, you have uh, 1 half h squared from here. But you also have plus h and then minus h over 2, so minus h squared over 2 here. So all the terms that have uh, power of h less than 3 um, end up uh, canceling out. Um, so all these terms go away. Um, so, so what you end up uh, getting is um, I'm not sure if I have in my notes what the final expression was. No, I don't have it here. But um, okay, it's not this. Um, all right, so you have h cubed. Okay, and then. Um, Out. Um, you end up with um, one six e to the squiggly h cubed plus terms of an even higher degree or h to the four, but the leading term is h cubed. Now, for order of uh, oh rate of convergence. You're trying to show that this is less than or equal to uh, some constant times uh, some simpler function of h as uh, h goes to zero. So what you end up getting, if I go ahead and um, take this, that uh, um, to have an upper bound, you can actually neglect this plus h over 2 in the denominator because I'm assuming h to be between 0 and 1. If uh, h is, uh, with her being positive, if you ignore it, then the, um, uh, the denominator gets smaller, which makes the whole fraction larger. Therefore, you have an upper bound. Um, so you can use that to show that this whole thing 
is less than or equal to a constant times h cubed. And uh, I apologize. I um, I haven't worked out on the fly, like right here in front of you, what the, 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 the constant C is. Uh, it is something I can take the time to do. Um, but um, but I'd rather have the, the time taken for other things. What I can do later is work out the rest of the details to show you what the constant of the capital C would be. But um, because there's going to be a term involving this and the minus h over 2 is going to be order h to the 4. And that would affect what the constant is. Um, okay. But um, and if you don't take the Taylor expansion out far enough, you end up not getting the proper uh, rate of convergence. Um, but so order h cubed, as we saw experimentally up here, and then analytically down here is how it should have turned out. Um, are there any questions about this one? So this turned out to be a more accurate approximation than the one in the midst than the practice. Practice uh, via exponential was uh, approximation was one over one plus h. Um, so here it's like the, the, the plus h that there used to be down here was broken up with the h over two down here and then h over two subtracted up here. It's the symmetry in that approximation that makes it more accurate or a more rapid rate of convergence than the other one. <clears throat> That's something we're, we're going to see now and then in other settings. Okay. Um, but I'll fill in more details on that um, later. Other contributions. Um, okay, this one, actually, this one went pretty well. Um, that uh, replacing the Taylor expansion um, leading term is uh, um, h to the first power, so the rate of convergence is over h. Um, okay, this one you have this uh, difference of square roots. When does it suffer from cancellation? So it's when the two values, the two square roots, are close to each other, um, where you have that uh, happening. Um, so you end up with, uh, when x is particularly large, is uh, uh, when that's a problem. Um, okay. um, actually, one thing uh, we're pointing out is, uh, a question like this, x squared minus 1, um, when you have, uh, okay. okay, we'll talk about that here, but, um, but uh, because this plus 1 or this minus 1, as x gets large, it ends up having a negligible effect on uh, uh, on, on the square root, and uh, in fact, if you take the limit of this expression uh, as x goes to infinity, um, yeah, the limit is actually zero. Uh, so it just gets worse and worse as x gets large. The uh, cancellation error that uh, uh, that you would infer. Um, okay, so. Um, Um, so then you multiply and find by a conjugate, the technique that we've seen in other, other, other problems. And then um, you end up with, uh, after you simplify as much as you can, then you have an addition of square roots rather than a subtraction. Um, so then this, this, so this expression is viable. And here it's easier to see what happens as x goes, gets larger and larger, how uh, the uh, whole fraction um, uh, goes to zero. Um, this one actually, I don't think this was much of a problem with this one. It's forming the Lagrange polynomials and multiplying by the y values. Um, and actually, I think the Newton interpolation one 
also went pretty well. I think uh, in some cases there might have been like a sign mistake when filling up a lot of different tables. This is what you get. You take the top row of coefficients um, and then use that to obtain the, um, uh, the uh, Newton form. Uh, any questions about these? Say it kind of hurt me. Now it simplifies. So, well, so sorry, what? Now it some of these things. Oh. I had the urge. Oh, oh okay. okay. It kind of hurt me. Well, I didn't simplify. Well, well, look at this way. Since I cared about seeing the unsimplified form, I would have not checked it yeah. to you simplifying them as long as the unsimplified form was written down. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, then, once you do, after you get the answer, I don't care. I didn't have issues with that one. Um, yeah, most people did. What's the other thing that's implied? Okay, lightning round. Um, some points were lost here. Put them a fair number of points. Um, yeah, when it's after the error be used in relative error, um, it's best. The might as well use absolute error when the exact value is very small. Um, because relative error in that, in that case can give it a correction of, uh, of accuracy. Um, otherwise, relative error is uh, more informative. Uh, how are backward and forward error related? This number, this number defined as the ratio of the two. Uh, so then if you can, uh, <coughs> if you don't have to estimate the backward error in this number, you can use that to estimate the forward error. Um, this one question, I think most people got this, uh, underflow versus uh, the unit round off or machine precision. Underflow is based on the exponent range, machine precision is based on how many, but based on your precision, um, the number of digits that you have. Um, okay. Um, so uh, there, there are a number of issues with floating point of the um, the ones that really derail your computation the most, I would have to say, are uh, overflow. Because if you get infinity, you're done. You can't, you just can't do anything more. Um, something that, that's like loss of precision that comes from like you know addition, multiplication, division. Um, yes, I mean very, very error occurring, but your computation goes on, and um, in most cases the error might not be so bad, but a bit. A, the exception is subtraction of two close number, catastrophic cancellation, where you can get serious inaccuracies, and as, as we know from the first day, uh, some very bad things can happen as a result. So, um, and uh, in both cases, you can try rewriting the expression that has an overflow or in like an intermediate result or a problematic subtraction to uh, get something better. Um, the Banner matrix is used to meet the coefficients of each triplet polynomial power form, but it's slow, it takes more operations than needed to meet the triplet polynomial. Also, um, if the x values are close together, the matrix is still conditioned, so you uh, throw off the accuracy of your coefficients. Um, okay, if you have three points, um, you can fit them with a quadratic. So, the, 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 however many points you have, the degree of each triplet polynomial is one less. Um, which will call polynomial is unique in this case. Um, and if uh, and you, you could come up with a higher degree polynomial that will also pass B3, but then if you lose uniqueness in that case because um, you have some degrees of freedom that you have to use. Um, okay, if you have these Lagrange polynomials, what properties do they have? The main one that's interested here is. The fact that it's equal to one, one of your interpolation points, and zero otherwise, which makes it really, really easy to compute the coefficients. So it's trivial to compute the coefficients of the interpolated polynomial in Lagrange form because they're just y values. Um, they draw back Lagrange polynomials, they're not progressive. Um, if you add interpolation points, you have to uh, recompute everything. 
flip side of this question, advanced uh, Newton interpolation, and Newton is progressive, so you can easily update the Newton polynomial um, if, if, if the new points. <laughs> and uh, finally, um, how can we convert from Newton form to power form? Main thing I'm looking for here. That's the multiplication. Um, because uh, Newton form has centers, which are the interpolation, multi interpolation points. Um, find this multiplication several times, uh, but or n times, or n is a degree, reverse all the centers to zero, and that's how it works. And that's that. Um, Questions about any of these? <clears throat> All right. Um, well, we have a good amount of time. What important? No, that's a, I don't know. Yeah, that's a big one. Um, no, I mean, she mentioned specifically having no more questions. So it'd be a good idea if she got back to you. Um, but we have time for anyone else who has no more questions. No more questions. I think Morgan and I were talking about them, so it's probably the same ones. Um, okay. I was having trouble in the MATLAB in 7.2, 7 .2, 7 2, and 3. Okay. Um, I have code, but it's not functioning properly. Yes, build orange. Okay. Um, okay, so these, these two. Yes. Okay. Um, <laughs> all right. Um, okay. Um, well, first, uh, I don't know if any particular question you want to ask about this one or. Um, like, like well, okay, so do you? I have more code questions. I guess I need to just have you look at my code to see. Um, okay, yeah, yeah, because I guess the other, the other questions that I would address here is like if anyone is having trouble understanding, uh, like what, how to get started. Yeah. Um, now, is there anyone in that category? Oh, okay. <laughs> um, Um, yeah, because um, what you need to do uh, is it's kind of like you're taking this verbal script and translating the code, where you have you know a loop like this that is uh, so um, because you have to compute n plus one the branch polynomials in total, so you get you get a loop that's going to run n plus one times. Um, now, here, the text, and then for most texts, will uh, index the Lagrange polynomials from 0 to n, uh, just like the x values are indexed from 0 to n. But MATLAB uses one based indexing. Um, so, um, but, so but, we're not numbering things different instead of 1 to n plus 1 instead of from 0 to n, because you need to use you know, j as an index, and MATLAB won't allow an index of 0. Um, now, uh, poly is used to handle the numerator of the graph poly uh, because uh, you know, poly constructs a polynomial that has uh, roots that select like points. So for each j, you want to construct a vector that contains all the interpolation points except xj. Um, the most straightforward way to do that is, is, is actually for an example from a tutorial um, where I showed an example of uh, building up a vector from nothing. Like you have an empty vector and you keep adding elements onto it. Um, so you could have a loop that goes through all the interpolation points and adds each one onto the vector except for one you want to exclude. Like you use an if statement. 
to exclude it. Um, there are other ways to do this sort of thing, but that's the one that is based on things that I've covered. Um, and then you can use poly with that vector of that has all the interpolation points except particular one. And that gives you the coefficients of the numerator of a Lagrange polynomial. But then you have to take that polynomial and use polyval to plug the remaining interpolation point into it because uh, and then you divide by that. Uh, so so poly, just as poly handles the numerator of the Lagrange polynomial, polyval gets you the denominator of the Lagrange polynomial, but it's just a number. Um, and then you end up with a row vector of coefficients of that Lagrange polynomial. And the last thing you do each time through this loop that you need is you store it in the matrix L. So you're um, uh, like you're, you're, you're assigning row J of the matrix to be that of the ground polynomial coefficients. So, so that's the, the plan for, for that one. I don't know if that happened to touch on any question you might have uh, with it or, okay. Yeah, I mean, I guess my main question, because I have a code that works, would be like, what is our outcome supposed to look like? Um, so it's a matrix. So it's just a, supposed to be a matrix, um, basically, yeah. any special characteristics? Um, well, like, okay, so however many interpolation points you pass into it, that's the size of the matrix. Um, so if I go back to an example here, okay, so here's where uh, you had four X values, four with runs polynomial generated, so you can use it as a test case. Um, so like the first row would have, um, okay, minus one six, plus one half, minus one third, and then zero, because there's no constant term. So the coefficients of this Lagrange polynomial order from highest degree to lowest. Second row would have these coefficients, and so on. Mm -hmm. yeah, so that's uh, what you're looking for. <coughs> um, in fact, I would recommend using this example to check because you already know what the result is supposed to be. Mm -hmm. um, and then, um, Uh, the other one, uh, Lagrange fit, there's not much to do because Lagrange fit needs to call make Lagrange and get the matrix L. Um, so it really is make Lagrange that's doing the heavy lifting. And once you have uh, L, that has your Lagrange polynomials, then you're just going to have a, a, another loop. Basically what you're doing is you're putting together your polynomial using this form. So you'll have a, you'll have a loop that computes this summation. So um, each time through the loop, you're going to tack on another term that will have one of your y values times this row vector of coefficients of the corresponding Lagrange polynomial. You add all those up, and you're, uh, then you have your output, which is a row vector consisting of uh, the coefficients of your interpolating polynomial. Um, and and again, you can go to like this example, um, and uh, like this should be the output of your. Uh, so you should just have a row vector. For yes. Okay. Uh, yeah, one row vector. Um, actually, the branch fit is possible to do in hardly any code at all because what do you? Um, What you could do is if you have, if you make your y values, and the function takes as input a row of the vector of x values, a vector of y values. There's not necessarily any, any assumption that whether these vectors are row vectors or column vectors. But if you force y to be a row vector, and then you multiply that by l, uh, so like so uh, y times l, where y is a row vector, that's actually the polynomial right there. Uh, so this loop that I described. That takes you know row row of l times the y value plus another row of l times that y value. That's actually matrix vector multiplication. So that would be a way to do it in one shot. Um, okay, what I should have been doing. 
is uh, things you notice about this. Um, So use that indexing scheme for uh, really for, for, for both problems. Um, okay. um, when you build up a vector of x values, um, excluding xj. Um, and you pass that to a poly function to get the numerator of the Lagrange polynomial uh, LJ. Um, then you evaluate that polynomial. Uh, um, look at the numerator uh, at XJ using polyval, but just flushing out a little more about what the problem said, but providing a few more details. Um, get the denominator. Um, and then you store the results. So this poly will return a row vector. I mean, you're dividing it by this number, and that's still a row vector. So J of matrix L. Um, that's, so that's the idea for <coughs> just reiterating. Um, okay. Um, okay, you call make Lagrange. So you get the matrix L. And then you compute the summation that's in. Okay, equation 7.4. Um, each row of L, Y, J, and it's equivalent to Y, L. Oops. Where Y is a row vector. Um, so like the matrix vector problem. Okay. Um, but, but certainly, you know, if, if, you're, if, you're, if you're, you can follow this and, 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 and produce code to the point where you can run it and it's not going, then you're welcome to, to show me. All right. Do you have any questions about these or any other? Oh. I do have a question, but it's. Um, Okay, so the algorithm you have for divided difference table. Yeah. Now, okay, you would just go with it and, and try, well, implement it in MATLAB, or, like, I'm just wondering whether you're, you're just giving us the algorithm, or we're I'm just pretty, testing. Well, yeah, um, what if you find is a, is a difference in indexing? Yeah. Um, so be careful about that. Yes. Um, now, Okay, if you look at the algorithm in question, um, so are you saying that I give away too much? No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's what it sounded like at first. Yeah. Um, okay, so this, so this is the algorithm you're referring to. Um, okay. Um, 
that the algorithm because would it's use not the, the reasoning is not the most obvious or at least not the most obvious to me okay like the interesting is and stuff but i assume it works it's supposed to work <laughs> okay <laughs> you know maybe but yeah it works so do we just take it as like something that's given to us and implemented or we're supposed to you know delve into it and see the reasoning Oh, um, well, you're probably going to do that anyway, but um, <laughs> uh, I am not requiring you to. Okay. So, yes, you are allowed to take for granted that yeah, uh, that's correctness the, of, of this. Yeah, taking it for granted, yes. Okay. okay. Uh, <laughs> now, um, there is something about this, though, that I do need to point out. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a, there's a, is that the algorithm we use for exploration 7.3.7? 7. Yes. yes. Um, now here's where you have to be careful because okay here we use indexing you know from zero to n, uh, whereas in MATLAB it's better to use like for instance in this loop I going from one to n plus one, um, and uh, and then, so in, in, in most cases what you see here is for indexing like you would like shift it everything by one, but there is one situation where um, uh, okay. Well, um, actually, maybe not, but Yeah, because like here we're building a matrix, and in this algorithm as written, the rows and columns would index from zero to n, but you'd be using um, uh, uh, one to n plus one. Um, You want to be careful about this one. Um, like going, going, going beyond the indices. Um, well, in terms of how you take the shifted indices into account, um, and unfortunately, the, the, the problem is, and the implementers implemented this long ago, and unfortunately, I don't remember exactly what I did. And if I pull it up on screen, you'll see it. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you don't need to do it. Yes, I don't want to do that. But um, your name is But yeah, <laughs> uh, okay. But um, what what? Okay, here's what I would suggest: is if you go ahead and implement this, um, and, and, and like you know, like before, like before, you can try it out on uh, you know, this is this example here to get this to find a difference table. Mm -hmm. So we should be getting a matrix that would include these. Um, it's going to be a triangular matrix because it's not going to fill in every entry. Um, and if you're not getting these, then um, what I would suggest is, you know, this is the main step uh, for to compute a single divided difference. Actually, print out what you have been subtracting, and you can make sure that it's pulling the numbers from the right locations. Um, and if you see that it's not, then you know that you messed up in the indexing somewhere. So, um, so, so that's how you can. Reduce your frustration. I have a question about 714. 714. Okay. Any questions about this one? I do believe it's for this one. Exactly. Okay. <laughs> 714. Um, by the way, if, if you are behind on homework, I can assure you. You are not alone. Um, okay. I'm supposed to work backwards. How we 
Okay. Um, I wouldn't, well, okay. The idea is that after you see what the matrix is from a first degree case, um, and you see where you have you know, entries that are zero or non-zero, um, then, and that's, that's a two by two system of equations. Um, well, now, uh, when you go to the second degree case, right, you're, you're trying to fit three points, so you're gonna have a three by three system and you want the matrix to have a similar structure in terms of which entries are zero or non-zero. The uh, most common mistake I see with this problem is, um, okay, you have here a first degree polynomial, like these linear factors, you know, x minus x1 or x minus x1. And then uh, someone will propose a form for P2 of x that will also have just a single linear factor at a time. P2 of x has to have degree two. Um, if, if you only have just linear factors multiplied by numbers and added together, that's still degree one. So, um, and um, since you want to have certain entries in your matrix be equal to zero, um, I think you, so, so, so you have to, to propose a form of P2 of X so that when you plug in X equal X naught, X1, X2, that certain terms go away because that is what happens in a degree one case. So this is about extrapolating to a more general case. Like you, you, you try to uh, similar case and then well, how do you make a similar thing happen um, when the problem grows in complexity a little bit? I just find this that we already have x and x one. Um, or, or, wait, x not x1? Or, or x not x1 with, because generally whenever we have those are whenever we have, um, well, we're, when we're dealing with the Van Lott non matrix. Yeah. Where, um, that's where the x not and all those are. Okay. Um, Right, so, but what happens is, okay, yeah, so the matrix, each entry is taking one of the x values and raising it to a power. Um, but now, uh, um, yeah, so, so now we're getting away from power form. Um, so in the, in the degree one case, you're going to have, yeah, you're going to have differences of x values. Um, so, so, yeah, so each, each entry can involve x naught and x1. Um, so, um, yeah, yeah, so, so, so possible for individual entries of the matrix to include all the interpolation points. I guess what I was confused on is, so we, we create a matrix just like the minimum matrix now. Um, right, yeah. And, and then taking, or before, um, you have these equations and these two dx values, and then you turn that into a linear system. Yeah. And then that's where you get your matrix. Yeah. So if we have a matrix and then taking that matrix and putting it to a linear system yeah. is what is my disconnect of that doesn't make sense. Uh, of, of, of taking, right. it, making whatever matrix for like tension matrix that I think for this, yeah, and then taking that and then putting it into a linear, uh, the writing out in the equation form. Okay. Oh, uh, so in other words, going from matrix form to equation form. Yes. Okay, because really you're going the other way in this problem. Like. You're, you're starting with the system of equations by plugging in each x and setting it equal to y. Okay. And then from that, you infer what the matrix of that system is. Um, okay, you do that to be one case. Then. Yeah, I was just thinking about that. Uh, okay. Um, I mean, you do want to be able to go in either direction. Yeah. Uh, but only one direction is needed here. 
Um, and then the idea is after you see the matrix that you get um, and see why you got the matrix that you got, like a certain um, and certain things, good things happening, um, then then the idea is okay. Based on that, you come up with a form of P two, and then carry out the same process, substitute each x, like equal y, get okay. the matrix. I think I'm just looking at it. Under Okay. I have an ideal calculus question that's not going to be over here. Okay. Okay. Um, we still have time. Maybe Berber. So exploration 7.317. Um, okay. Oh, the final difference is over. Got to start by using the algorithm. Um, and then get the algorithm into the math algorithm. Um, yeah, that, that's exactly what we do. Um, yeah, so um, <coughs> now um, you look at that algorithm, okay, here. Um, okay, yes, so the algorithm produces a matrix that holds all the five differences, but then you, your output is a vector that consists of the diagonal entries of that matrix, but that's what this last loop. Uh, takes care of. So, if you implement this algorithm and you try it out on, uh, like on this example with uh, this data, um, the output of your functions is actually just be the top row. Of the, so, so it's not going to be the whole five different table, but yeah, three minus seven, eight minus six. Uh, although, what you could do trying to get your function to work is um, in your algorithm, in your implementation, when you get down to this point and you've computed the matrix D that has all the divide differences, you can have your code printed out and then you, you can see the whole divide difference table and make sure it's correct. Um, so I should mention that the, the other MATLAB problem from this section, 738. Um, so it's, it's, it's quite different from Lagrange fit. LeGrange, so polyfit, MATLAB's polyfit computes each of like polynomial in power form using a band bond matrix. Lagrange fit also computes the coefficients of each of like polynomial. It uses Lagrange form to do it. But the output of polyfit and Lagrange fit actually be the same. Um, Newton Val is different though. Um, Newton Val's job is not to compute a coefficient of each other polynomial. It's meant to um, simply evaluate each other polynomial at given x value. So here are your x and your y that you're interpolating, and then you pass in as a third argument a different vector of x's, that that could be any number, any x values you want. And Newton's val will evaluate the uh, Newton turbulent polynomial at those x's and produce these, these y's. Um, so, okay. All right, so, uh, I'll fill some more notes in here.
of 7.328. Um, so a process um, is, a, a, so there's some delegation here. You're going to call div diffs um, from 737 to get the uh, five differences. Um, and then um, use uh, nested multiplication. Um, okay, so the nested multiplication algorithm is given here. Right? So really what you're doing in your new valve function is uh, implementing this. Um, because you'll, you'll have your five difference coefficients, your C's, from calling div diffs. Uh, so it's the output of that. Um, and then you would uh, implement this loop, and then the output of this loop is uh, is your y values. So, uh, so there's not a whole, there's not a whole ton of code involved in Newton's valve. So it calls div diffs to do the heavy lifting, getting five differences, and then you do this. Um, so what I would suggest for testing is um, so you should compare um, this expression Newton val x y x x to I would normally do this in MATLAB. If you call polyfit x, y, n, that gives you a triple A polynomial, but then you pass the result of that to polyval with second argument x, x. Um, polyval. Yeah, polyval is for evaluating the polynomial in MATLAB, where uh, n has to be equal to the length of x minus 1. Uh, that's the degree. So, so once you write your Newton valve function, you, 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 so check this against this. They should match. Um, last time's almost over, but we still have some time for any remaining more questions. Yeah, I'm over too. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, uh, oh, um, okay, so Thursday and Friday is fall break. Um, so I'm not going to be holding.